Welcome to Gen Z Hoops, the Gen Z basketball coaching and sports business show. On this podcast, you'll learn from professional players, coaches, and executives from all over the world and see the court in a brand new way. And now, joining you courtside, your Gen Z host, John Hartafillis. Hey, Brittany, what's going on? What's up, John? I'm good. How are you? Awesome getting to speak with you. I know right, you're super busy working for three teams, basically, and you're doing so much with all your work. As a registered dietitian, it's really, really cool what you're, what you're up to. So just obviously really want to jump right in and make, make sure we can kind of tell your story to someone else who might be younger and want to do the same thing. Awesome. Sounds good. Awesome. So, I mean, just to start, I'm, I'm curious, did you always know, or maybe when you were in high school, right, taking it all the way back, that this was the path you were going to go down? Or was it something that once you got to college, you maybe changed your major and, every, and, and that road kind of became more clear as you got older? Yeah, so I was actually pretty fortunate to decide in high school that this is what I wanted to do. So growing up, I always played sports and actually basketball was my favorite sport. That's what I played kind of all growing up. And so when I got into high school, I was trying to decide, like as I got closer to college and trying to decide what I wanted to pursue for a career and for my degree, I always loved sports and knew I couldn't play sports my whole life. But if I could like do something in it, I thought that would be cool. And then also loved like the food nutrition side. So I wanted to just like kind of put those two together. It was like, if I could do food and nutrition uh, for athletes and teams, like that would be awesome. So didn't really know too much about the field at all. Didn't know, even know the term dietitian, but wanted to do that. And so pursued an undergrad in nutritional sciences. And I went to Texas A&M uh, for my undergrad. And so Knew heading in that I wanted to do sports nutrition and knew for sure that I was like a sports. Like I didn't want to do a lot of dietitians work in like a hospital setting or something like that, but knew I didn't want to work in a hospital, knew I wanted to do sports specifically. So started the degree in nutritional sciences and it actually had a lot more like science courses than I realized, uh, but uh, got through all the organic chemistries and biochemistries and all that type of stuff um, and then got to work with the sports dietitians there as well. Definitely always do a little prayer for my friends taking orgo and all that stuff. I hear about it all the time uh, in their classes. So I could, uh, of course, imagine what that must have been like while you were there. I mean, w- w- were you maybe hands on with any of the teams over there at Texas? Like, how did that work in terms of you getting actual experience away from the classroom? Yeah, so I was fortunate enough to, again, like I mentioned, to work with the sports dietitians there at Texas A&M. And so I got to see, like, hands on kind of what their day to day looked like. And I did a little bit with the teams directly there. I mainly actually worked with the football team there whenever I was an undergrad student. Had a little bit of exposure to other teams, but it was primarily football that I was around. We got to see kind of the ins and outs and the practical side of the job and just loved it, like really enjoyed it. So um, to become a registered dietitian, you have to do a dietetic internship after your um, undergrad. So I had to do a year of that after undergrad. So kind of had a year after college that didn't really do specific sports nutrition, but was doing the required work to sit for my board exam. So rotated in different settings, like the hospital, food service, kind of different settings, which it's skills that I use, um, but it wasn't specific to sports. And so then from there, um, had a more specific sports um, experience, which was awesome at Auburn University. Thinking about your stuff at Auburn, I mean, I always talk to, when I talk to GAs, it's always like basketball coaching GAs and they're on the floor and they're doing all that stuff. I haven't really spoken to someone who does anything other than that. So can you talk maybe a little bit about what your role was as a GA at Auburn? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so that's, that is the kind of the most common, I guess, or best well-known graduate assistant position is coaching because like football has it, basketball has it. A lot of sports have kind of like a GA position and they kind of have to do the ground work kind of stuff. And then for, for my field, there are a few uh, graduate assistant chips for a sports dietitian and you can do it in some other fields too. Like even like research, for example, would have it, but for my position in that setting there, uh, Auburn university had a full-time sports dietitian. So then it was him and then my position. So I was a registered dietitian at the time. I had just taken my board exam. So then I was able to take, did my master's degree in exercise physiology and then work uh, basically full time with the sports dietitian there. So that was where I really got like daily hands-on experience with a lot of sports teams. And that was a really great experience um, to learn from him and also learn from like the day-to-day operations of teams um, in the athletic department there. 
Awesome. And then, I mean, it's incredible thinking about the other sides of GA because that's something right, I always thought it was just coaching. Even even going to this, into going to this, I always thought that was, that was the only avenue for what GAs do. Uh, but you've right, you've been dropping words like nutrition and dietitian all, all over the place. And maybe the common listener might think that they're both the same thing. I mean, and, and they're obviously not. They're right. They're two very specific things and they're incredibly different. I mean, can you go into what, what's so different about them? Yeah. So the biggest thing is when it comes to credentials of a nutrition professional. So you always want to look for a registered dietitian. That one has uh, legal definitions and you have to do an undergrad degree in nutritional sciences. So you have to get qualifications in order to apply for a dietetic internship. And then you have to get selected to complete a dietetic internship. And that's about a 50% match rate right now. So you have to get matched with the program and then complete that program, which is 12, over 1200 hours of supervised practice in uh, different dietetics um, areas. So like clinical food service. So like, for example, in the clinical, we would learn different disease states and how to treat it nutritionally type stuff. So you have to do all that and then sit for a nationally recognized board exam. And if you pass that, then you have the credential of a registered dietitian. And so that is a certified expert in nutrition, whereas you'll also hear terms like nutritionist. So that term has no legal definitions. So like you could call yourself a nutritionist, any really anyone on the street can call themselves a nutritionist. And that means nothing. Like it doesn't mean that that there's no qualifications in order for someone to call themselves that. Whereas if you have a registered dietitian, then they're certified. And then in the sports world, in the sports um, dietetics world, there's a, another certification that's a specialty certification for sports dietitians. Um, and that one's called the Certified Specialist sports di- or Certified Specialist in Sports Dietetics. And that one, you have to be a registered dietitian for two years at least, and then work with athletes for 1,500 hours, I believe, until you can sit for the exam for that. Definitely a lot of info there. So if this is something that you're interested in as a listener and doing, definitely do your research and to see, okay, hey, what does this world actually look like? But it's incredible right hearing it from you and, 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 and what actually goes into it and what you've obviously been through in doing that. I'm thinking about maybe that some of the, once you got at, you finished up with being a GA and you got into that real world application of, of everything, you spent a few years on the, on the college scene. And I'm, 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 I would imagine that it's very different from the pro scene you're, you're, you're looking at now, but I'm, I'm still curious as to what that college scene looked like as when, when that was your, your actual full-time job in, in being their dietitian. Yeah, so the college athletics scene is very different than the professional scene, as you can imagine. So from, yeah, from Auburn, I worked at Indiana University for a couple of years, which was a great, great experience. And that was my first like full-time job out of school. So yeah, still had a lot to learn, but really enjoyed that position there. Um, I was working with several teams there as kind of their sports performance dietitian. And so on the college setting, I mean, you're in college now, right? Yep. So, so, you know, so you kind of know like your, like your daily schedule, right? It's pretty hectic. And like, if and then if you, so like a college schedule in general, and then you add on, if you're a college athlete, the schedule is pretty hectic and they're busy from, you know, first thing in the morning till late at night between lifts, practices, you know, meetings, classes, tutor, like depending on what year they are and that type of thing, but it's very busy. So when we look at the sports schedule and the sports demands from a nutrition perspective, it's hard to, or it can be challenging to eat the right amount of food and the right type of food within their limitations and their schedule. So it's, I would say that's the biggest challenge that we're trying to make convenient for them. uh, In addition to educating them on how to do that. So it's providing meals and snacks through a variety of facilities there at, at college, at the college. And that's also educating them on how to do that for their, for their individual goals. So, you know, if we have a you know, a football player versus a soccer player versus a baseball player, all of those needs can be different. And then individually too, if they are looking to make any body composition changes, or if they have any medical concerns that affect their eating or anything like that, or food allergies or nutrient deficiencies or any type of thing that um, they need certain nutrients or certain things in their diet, we help them with that um, as well. Incredible. So definitely these college athletes are really getting uh, the full experience and, and really trying to get like every percentage point of out, out of their own abilities as possible, right? And going through all these measures. And definitely something that's curious, right? I'm thinking about me coaching high school basketball. I would love, wish some of my guys could have that, but they'll have to wait a couple more years until they get to the college level to, to experience that. But then going over to the pro side, I mean, that's obviously every team has, well, even especially now, right? It's, it's a clip where every team has a dietitian and maybe five of them or, or whatever it might look like where these teams are really staffing up. I mean, what did it look like for you in, in, in making the jump from college to the pro scene when you had been in college for so 
long. I mean, what did the decision for you look like and, and how did it play out? Yeah, so I really enjoyed college. Um, I really enjoyed getting to know the athletes and working with the, you know, I, I really, in that setting, I learned that I really liked working with the same athletes, same teams and having that team environment and getting to know and working with the same people, right? Because you can build that rapport, build that relationship, which is important for providing nutrition education and getting them to hopefully change their behavior towards those things. And so I really enjoyed that setting. And so I kind of just, I guess, progressed to um, actually took a different job, which provided some different opportunities. And so stayed in the college for a little bit there, but then transitioned to some professional teams, which has been really cool. Um, and yeah, the nutrition challenges are, are, there's still nutrition challenges in the professional world, but they look a little bit different. The environment's different. The resources are different. The daily schedule's different. So it's kind of learning just the different um, challenges that athletes face, depending on the sport, the setting, the level, and then trying to address those the best I can. Oh, of course, that must be so cool. I'm working with teams like the Mavs, the Wings, FC Dallas. I mean, totally different teams. Right? You have, there are some teams where there's seven footers, other teams where people aren't as tall, other teams where right, you, have, you have guys that are, are over 300 pounds, people that are under that, uh, under 150. Um, and they're, right, all these huge differences. And that's, those are just the basic differences. Obviously, so many things and people just like that are maybe the same. They look the same, but everyone everyone's different. Um, it's incredible thinking about how all that stuff changes with, with, with each person. Um, one thing in terms of when it comes to everything, in terms of someone's diet that I found really interesting was the, the documentary Game Changers. I watched it two years ago as a, at a recommendation from one of the athletic trainers at Xavier. And he was telling me about how you, you have to watch this movie. It'll really open your eyes to it. After watching it, I told my mom, like, okay, we're cutting out all meat from our diet because it, it really, it shocked me. And it lasted for about maybe a week or two, maybe, maybe that long uh, until real life set in and, and, and that really became very difficult. But I'm curious maybe as to, I mean, because it's, it's become something, a, a narrative, maybe that everything about plant-based diets has been so spoken about it and, and, and there's so many NBA players or, or, or other athletes in other sports that are going on these diets and, and having breakout years. I mean, what has that looked like in the actual world coming from a professional? Uh, yeah. So the, the documentary Game Changers was popular there for a little bit. And I think in a sense, it's good that people are talking about nutrition, right? Like that's always good. But then the implementation is where we want to what we what we want to consider for the athlete because with that like a plant-based diet does not mean 100 percent plant-based diet it doesn't have to mean 100 percent plants so it's important to evaluate the nutritional contents of someone's diet with the amount that they're eating the type that they're eating in relation to everything that's specific to them so that's going to be their sport their training their goals and then there are some things i mean yes plants are absolutely good for you but there's also some animal foods that are Good for you too. And so I think it's a mix of, uh, of those things. And sure, we have athletes that do prefer to, to be 100% plant-based, which if that's the case, great. We just want to make sure that they are covering all their needs, um, their larger needs, like their, their overall calorie needs, their carbohydrate needs, their protein needs, their fat needs, but also the smaller nutritional needs. So like your vitamins and minerals, like iron and B12 and just calcium and kind of all those different um, smaller nutrients that are really important for overall health and athletic performance. And some, depending on the nutrient, depending on the food, we get, we have better absorb some nutrients from animal products. And so just in general, like if we have, like if my approach is if we have, if I have an athlete that is interested or wanting to change their diet pretty drastically, you know, it's, I always like to look at what they're currently doing, you know? And so if you like, like, just like you said, like you said, you kind of went from, it sounded like a pretty big shift, but it was not very sustainable, right? You did it for a week. So I think that that's an important thing that we need to consider with the diet is it's got, it's got to be sustainable um, in a way that is healthy. And so it's, if, if they do want to transition to that, then I think that we can, we can do that. Um, but I always like to educate the athlete too on the pros and cons um, of all those things. Super important to consider all those things and all right, especially considering maybe how quickly people might just jump on something because this was popular trending on Twitter. I mean, one of the actually the funniest I saw with this one tweet you posted of, of, some of Dennis Rodman, people going from fat to fat, that way, that way, that way, that way. Uh, I thought that was hilarious. And I can imagine where right, there's definitely a lot of other of that, all those inside jokes um, in the whole world of dietetics. But thinking about something like that and, and maybe how people, how quickly people change from what uh, keto to all this other stuff. I mean, how much you see that as being somewhere people just jumping to one just because they hear it's good and let me just try it. Right. Yeah. I mean, people always want the like latest and greatest and they want like, here's what I've recently learned. So like, you know, how like with stocks now, like in the, all these meme stocks and like the cryptos and all this stuff, people want like quick money, right? They want it like, yep. like right away and they want to get rich quick. Right. 
Same thing with nutrition. People want that like quick fix. They don't want to like, they just want it to like all of a sudden be there. And so, but that, that's not really how we get results with nutrition. I mean, it's gotta be like you eat the rest of your life. And so it's gotta be something that's sustainable and practical. And of course we want it to be nutritionally adequate for your needs and that type of stuff. But yeah, people like to kind of just like, you know, whatever the next biggest thing is, or it's like, oh, this, you know, I heard this is going to help me. And it's like, well, who, like, who did you hear that from kind of thing? I mean, we hear a lot of things and, you know, there's, we need to filter those things to see if they're accurate and run it through people that are qualified in that area, you know? And I think it's, it's interesting in nutrition because like, if you have, if you have tooth problems, who do you go see? You go to the dentist right away. You should, you hopefully go to the dentist. Yeah. So you go see a dentist. If you have, you know, general medical problems, you go to a doctor. If you have, um, you know, see, so we always have, we have certain people that we go to with certain things, but when it comes to nutrition, it's like, oh, I'll read this article. I'll Google this. I'll uh, believe my grandma. I'll like, it's kind of like, we don't, we need to go to registered dietitians for those because that's like, that's what, that's what we're trained to do. And that's what we do. And so we're, we are, like I said, we're trained to do just that is to take all the information that's out there look at the science and apply that to the athlete and their situation and the goals. It's incredible thinking about doing that and how important that must be. I mean, I, I definitely situations and how, how much of a role those, those play in, in, in what you're doing and, and how you're kind of administering that and how important right it is to, to make sure you're not just jumping at something because it's, it's cool, it's popular. It's actually because someone that, that knows what they're talking about is, is, is directing you to do so. Mm-hmm. And, and thinking about maybe just the situations in, in which that stuff is important. Um, obviously with, with professional sports, I mean, things are drastically changing. It, it, things are, are so sporadic maybe where you're, an East Coast team is playing the West Coast. Now it's 11 o'clock and it, it's, two o'clock in the morning your time when the game's over what do you do or you're playing a back-to-back and i mean how how much do situational factors like that because i would imagine right the off season is very different from preseason and the playoffs and and how someone needs during those times when they're really working intensely i'm like how do those situations really impact what these athletes are putting in their body right we definitely want to consider all those things and that's where you know all those factors play a part right so like the time zone, the elevation, the when when our last game was, um, when like all all of those factors do play a part, and that's where we do want to have individualized nutrition strategies for those situations because all those that is different than you know, but especially in the NBA, right? They're playing they're playing a lot of games like in back, like close together, which is very different than other sports or other situations, and so all those nutrition strategies should look a little bit different and they should address those type of things. And so I think it's taking a look at all those things and, you know, it's working with other professionals on the team to have knowledge in different areas and trying to put together a plan that does um, provide the athlete um, the best chance at staying healthy and recovering. I think really important to think of that. And one thing that I, I, I've been thinking about in, in terms of, right, it's, it's awesome that all these pro athletes have someone like you to go to, or that obviously, right, there's, there's all these, these great resources for that to happen if going to register registered dietitian, um, whether it's the college game or the, or the pro game, but there are, right, maybe it's high school athletes that maybe don't have access to all those things. Um, and I, right, with, with the freshmen that I coach, they'll always come to me like, I'll always be, oh, eat more, right? You, you got to grow. Like, that's always maybe the narrative you'll hear, or you'll hear older coaches telling someone, okay, if you just put on some more size, you'll play at the next level or right. all this. And they're like, well, I don't know what to eat. Or I, I try to, but there's no food at home. Or I open the thing and there's no, there's right. only thing like you, it's, you open up a cupboard and there's all this food in there, but not what you want. And that's maybe where the problem comes into play. I mean, what's some adv- advice you give to someone that maybe is quote unquote, a little younger and maybe helpless in their pursuit of picking out exactly what they want to eat and what they should be eating? Sure. And I think there is a difference between like, generally speaking, what we want to eat and maybe what is going to be beneficial for us to eat. And so I think that's where nutrition, if you're eating for performance, that's going to look a little bit different than probably what you would prefer to eat based on your taste buds, unless you just love the taste of healthy food, not to say healthy food, like, but healthy food can taste good. That's the thing. And so I think it's for kind of those athletes at lower levels, you know, I think it's two things I would say that I see a lot, especially in basketball players, younger basketball players is eating infrequently. So like they don't eat enough, like they may not eat until, you know, lunch or mid afternoon and then eating low nutrient foods. So really it's trying to eat consistently throughout the day. And that's going to depend on, you know, when you have practice, when you have school, when you have certain commitments, but eating frequently throughout the day so that your energy is adequate for your training and for growth. Like if you're trying to grow too, like and you're not even eating enough for your training, there's, you're not going to be able to grow like you would like to. So it's eating enough. And then also trying to include nutrient rich foods. And it doesn't have to be 
you know, that doesn't mean a salad every meal. That just means including nutrient rich foods. So like fruits and vegetables, trying to get fruits and vegetables in. Okay. You can eat them raw. You can eat them in a smoothie. You can eat them any form works, but we do want to get fruits and vegetables. Those are going to provide great antioxidants, vitamins and minerals. Um, and then other nutrient rich foods. I mean, it just like quality carbohydrates are things like rice, potatoes, um, pasta, sandwiches, or like breads. It doesn't have to be this like, or it doesn't always have to be organic, or it doesn't have to be like some of these other things. It's just trying to eat good quality foods. And I think for the most part, I think most people know what, what those kind of things are. I think it's just more so choosing those things as opposed to, you know, going to get our favorite fast food or going to get those kind of things. And I think there's also room for like, you know, making things that we like a little bit healthier in a sense, like pizza, you know, we can make that, we can make that a little bit healthier if we like get some, if we make it at home and we'd use like chicken, for example, as the topping or a lean ground beef or something like that, as opposed to getting a meat lovers at pizza hut or whatever. So I think there are some things like that that we can do that we're still eating foods we enjoy, but we've just made some small changes and we're doing that with like, again, some veggies on the side. So we're just looking for ways to add in a little bit more nutrient rich foods and choosing that more over those lower nutrient foods. So one, one more thing I wanted to talk to you about is, is your love, is your love for pizza or when you, right, when you, when you <laughs> talk about it or you tweet about it or it's on Instagram saying about how, and, and, and we'll look at pizza and say, oh, that's junk food or that's automatically, it's automatically unhealthy. I mean, what are some ways to make pizza healthy? Yeah. So the, yeah, I mean, I, I, so I love pizza. Yeah. I eat pizza pretty often. Uh, and I'm not saying like, I'm also not a proponent of trying to like healthify everything. Like I think to, so I think there's a mix of that, you know, I think it depends on how often you're eating it and all that kind of stuff. And it depends on the person, but so in general, if we are looking to make pizza a little bit healthier and it kind of depends on that, that person's goals on if they're, you know, trying to put on some weight or lean out or whatever it may be. But um, we can, like I mentioned, we can change the toppings because a lot of times pizza, the toppings are pretty fatty. So like if you're doing like pepperoni, sausage, ham, bacon, if like a meat lovers kind of thing, or like, have like, so, you know, all those are pretty high in fat and not the healthy fat. So if we can choose leaner toppings, so if we did do a chicken or a, or a lean ground beef or throw veggies on there, things like that, we're going to naturally bring down the calories because we're lowering the fat content. We could also do, you know, if we're looking at the, the crust, we could do like a whole grain crust, or there's a lot of options now that you can buy that are like sprouted grain, which basically is just a form of a whole grain, but it has more fiber. So things like that as well. So we can, you know, and I think too, it's, that's one option. We can, you can also, like, if you're looking to lose a little bit of weight, if you're kind of in that, on that side of it, you could also eat pizza, but eat less than what you would normally eat, you know? So if you're, if you normally eat a whole pizza for a dinner, you know, instead cut back to two pieces and add a, you know, a side salad or a pretty good size salad. So there's things like that that we can do too, depending on the, the person and their goals um, and, and what kind of foods they generally like to enjoy. I love that. And it, pizza is a perfect way to end anything, whether it's a party or, or whatever it is. <laughs> so it's definitely a perfect way to end this show because you've you taught us all so much, whether, whether it's someone that really wants to get into the field or someone that is just curious and, and wants to just maybe better their nutrition a, 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 just, just as much as they can from this episode. I mean, it's been incredible hearing from you and, and really, Brittany, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing this with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Gen Z Hoops. Make sure to follow, like, and subscribe on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all major social media platforms at Gen Z Hoops. You can tune in and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and every other podcast platform on the planet. Get ready for the next episode.